banned. A Cedars Hills Elementary School is starting its own music program, but how popular will it be? I'm Jen Benson. And I'm Ashley Mungia. It's November 7th, and in Utah, it's 12 o'clock. From KBYU and the BYU Department of Communications. This is the award-winning 11 News at Noon. After a long and hard-fought campaign season, President Obama defeated Governor Mitt Romney for four more years in the White House. Reporter Jeff Merrill shows us the night ended with two very different speeches, but one idea about a united America. Newly elected President Obama has to tackle problems like the fiscal cliff, but before getting back to work, he celebrated here in Chicago at his election headquarters. An electrified crowd greeted President Obama early Wednesday morning. He says he's ready for four more years. With your stories and your struggles, I returned to the White House more determined and more inspired than ever. His re-election comes after a nail-biting night of returns. The president won several critical swing states, including Ohio. I want to thank every American who participated in this election. Not many of those key battleground states went Mitt Romney's way, making it impossible for him to pick up the 270 electoral votes needed to win. In the early hours, after a long election day, Mitt Romney said he had called President Obama and the race was over. I so wish that I had been able to fulfill your hopes to lead the country in a different direction, but the nation chose another leader. Romney didn't talk about his future plans, but did talk about the country's future. And I ran for office because I'm concerned about America. This election is over, but our principles endure. Jeff Merrill, 11 News. The next step for the first family, they head straight back to the White House where it will be business as usual. They will be back home on Pennsylvania Avenue this afternoon. The Varsity Theater was probably the loudest place on campus election night. Yeah, and with students to the right and left, they lined up out the door to get some free food and a chance to support their side. 11 News reporter Clark Gerford is live on BYU campus. So Clark, how did students react when the big announcements came? Students filed into the big election night party on campus, and while there wasn't as much yelling and screaming as at a football game, there was still plenty of excitement. Oh, I'm ecstatic. I'm, I'm over the moon. This is probably the second happiest moment. I voted for him the first time. I voted for him again. Seats were hard to come by as students packed the varsity theater to cheer on their favorite candidate and, of course, grab some free pizza. But while Democrats celebrated, the result of the presidential election left Republicans with a bad taste in their mouths. I thought that there was a potential that it could go extreme either way, and it looks like it took a turn for the worse. Student Democrats say that the biggest problem with Romney's campaign was the perception that he is out of touch with the middle class, women, and minorities. They say President Obama is the right choice for BYU and for the rest of America. For me, as a BYU student, um, he represents the things that I believe um, and the things that I study. Um, he represents the, the poor and the less fortunate. Um, he represents the minorities. Um, these are all people that I care about. Republican students remain skeptical of the president's plan for the economy in an unstable job market. I'm graduating in less than a year from college, and so I was hoping to find a better job market to go to. I want to see the economy turn around. We've had so many problems with gas prices going up, jobs being lost. So I think that that's just my main issue that I want to see fixed right now. Barack Obama is the third straight American president re-elected to a second term. What's interesting is that both Presidents Clinton and Bush saw approval ratings drop after they were re-elected. So we'll see what happens with President Obama. On BYU campus, Clark Gerber, 11 News. Clark, I know you talked with some BYU students. So tell me, do you think they're disappointed that they don't have their first LDS president? Um, well, obviously, there's some disappointment for the uh, Republican students, but only a few people I talked to even mentioned religion, so it seems they're more interested in the candidates' platforms than their faith. All right. Thanks, Clark. The story of the night ended up being in the new 4th Congressional District race. It was a record high setting with more money spent on both sides than any congressional race Utah has ever seen. 11 News reporter Sean Gordon and Brenna Donnelly have a recap of the 4th District race between Congressman Jim Matheson and Mia Love. It was a long night of waiting for Congressman Jim Matheson. 
Candidate after candidate either accepted or conceded victory, but the results of the fourth district race between he and Mia Love weren't made final until after midnight, when Matheson was declared the winner. It was a tight race with less than 3,000 votes separating the two candidates, but Matheson is no stranger to close races. He beat John Swallow by less than 2,000 votes in 2002, won against Morgan Philpott by less than 5% in 2010. He spent most of the day campaigning, looking to pick up every last vote, and the most public and expensive race in Utah was also the closest, where every vote truly did count. At Democratic headquarters, I'm Sean Gordon, 11 News. And I'm Brenna Donnelly with the Mia Love campaign, where spirits were hopeful for most of the night. We are going to win this. Yeah! I'll be here. I'll be here till she gives her victory speech. But at around midnight, the state released the final numbers. Love lost by 1.2% of the vote, about 2,800 people. I've lost an election before by one vote. I think that she needs to stay involved and stay out there because she has a lot of people around the country that are inspired by her and just her, her life story. No word yet on Love's future political plans, but with this election, she's proven that she can be competitive. In Salt Lake City, Brenna Donnelly, 11 News. So Congressman Matheson will head back to his office in Washington, D.C. in January, but this time representing a new district. No real surprises in Utah's governor race. Governor Gary Herbert handedly beat challenger Peter Cook. But as 11 News reporter Jeff Merrill and Lauren Simpson show us, with his victory all but official, the presidential race was on the governor's mind. Just as Governor Gary Herbert started his acceptance speech for another four years at the head of the Beehive State, some bad news for Republicans overshadowed that joy. Mitt Romney lost the national election. Herbert says this is giving him greater resolve as a governor. He says that a Republican loss for the White House will put more pressure on Republican governors. I'm here to tell you the best hope for America as we go forward is the states. And led by Republican governors, this country will survive. Herbert beat challenger Peter Cook with 68% of the vote. Even with a few disappointments during the night, Governor Herbert says he's looking forward to his first full four-year term as Utah's governor. With the Herbert campaign in Salt Lake City, I'm Jeff Merrill. And I'm Lauren Simpson at Democrat headquarters, where Utah Democrats celebrated a national victory, but conceded to Republicans in many local elections. Peter Cook lost heavily to incumbent Governor Gary Herbert, taking only 28% of the vote. But the honk and wave candidate says Utah must continue to fight for the issues his campaign addressed, especially public education reform. His team took to the streets on the morning of Election Day, not just as a last attempt to sway the undecided, but to encourage everyone to get out and vote. With the election over, Cook hasn't announced any plans to run again for governor, but promises he'll continue to serve the state. At Democratic headquarters, I'm Lauren Simpson, 11 News. This was Governor Herbert's first win for a full four-year term as governor. He took over in 2009 when then-Governor John Huntsman accepted an ambassadorship to China. Herbert did win a special election in 2010 to retain his seat. It was the last go-around for a titan of Utah politics as Senator Orrin Hatch fought for his seventh term as U.S. Senator against Democratic opponent Scott Howell. 11 News reporter A.J. Swartwood and Karen Sullivan were at the respective campaign headquarters to break down the race. On a night filled with presidential tension, Senator Orrin Hatch's race was never in question. The six-term senator came into the night as an overwhelming favorite and did not disappoint his supporters with a resounding 35-point victory over Democratic opponent Scott Howell. Utah's senior senator said he was grateful for his opportunity to serve despite the disappointing result for presidential hopeful Mitt Romney. With the Democrats maintaining control of the Senate, Hatch will not be a chairman, but plans to be a powerful voice nonetheless. Senator Hatch hopes to seal his legacy with his last term on Capitol Hill. With the Hatch campaign in Salt Lake City, I'm A.J. Swartwood. And at Democratic headquarters, I'm Karen Sullivan. 
Scott Howell will not be our next U.S. Senator, but he says his campaign still achieved many of its goals. His campaign emphasized the we in Howell, attempting to bridge the two parties. He says he wanted voters to realize the power they have to make change in the government. Now the responsibility to foster bipartisanship falls on Senator Orrin Hatch, but Howell is critical of Hatch's ability to make meaningful change in Washington. Yet Howell says he hopes Hatch will take steps to end gridlock in the Senate. At Democratic headquarters, I'm Karen Sullivan, 11 News. And in another race that came down to the last day, Democratic State Senator Ben McAdams will take over the Salt Lake County mayor's seat. He beat Republican challenger Mark Crockett 54 to 45. McAdams credits the win to his campaign approach. He says he chose to be positive and upbeat without going negative. Definitely a good approach to take. Yeah, staying positive. All right, Highland City had a controversial issue on their ballot about keeping businesses open on Sundays. But the people voted down the idea 54% to 46. Right, and when 11 News at noon returns. Crime watchers, Provo police are training volunteers to keep an extra eye out in your neighborhood. An elementary at Melody, a school in Cedar Hills, is putting trumpets in students' hands. We'll show you their plans for a new band program. Stay with us. A bank robbery in Orem disrupted voting for a little while yesterday. Police closed two nearby polling locations for a half hour to investigate the holdup. Authorities say the suspect claimed that he had a gun, but no one ever saw a weapon. The suspect did get away, but officials are not sure with how much money. How safe is your neighborhood? The Provo City Police trains new recruits every month for the City Mobile Watch Team to help fight crime in your area. 11 News reporter Ashley Hudson found out exactly how these volunteers are trained. They patrol your streets armed with nothing but the car they drive and the phone in their hands. The Provo City Mobile Watch members are just ordinary Provo citizens with only an hour of police training. In 1998, the watch team began. Its goal? To stop crime in Provo. Any Provo citizen that passes a criminal background check, fingerprint scan, training session, and a ride-along can join the watch team. Members serve as what Officer Bascom says are reliable eyewitnesses to criminal activity. We need all the, the help from good citizens in Provo to help be our eyes and ears and help us uh, fight crime and improve the quality of life for Provo. Volunteers practice recognizing suspicious activity, observing details, and recording information. They are allowed to follow vehicles but not pursue cars in a chase. Provo City Mobile Watch are allowed to patrol their neighborhood, but not like police. They can roll down their window, though, and talk to people on the street. These mobile watchdogs look for minors out after curfew, illegal drug use, and any suspicious people or vehicles. Officer Bascom says crime rate in Provo is 50 to 60 percent lower since the program began. If you just imagine how many people you would need to patrol all the neighborhoods of the city, you would have to have a police department five times as big or bigger. Provo police hold extra training sessions once every three months to keep current volunteers prepared. In Provo, Ashley Hudson, 11 News. Watch members may be in your area one to two times a month, and you can identify them by their Provo City Mobile Watch placards on their cars. An American Fork treasurer suspected of stealing $80,000 from the city is pleading not guilty. Officials accused Heidi Mitchell of stealing the money over a three-year period back in March. The prosecuting attorney says he thinks an insurance company has paid the city back, which means that the insurance company will fall victim if Mich Mitchell goes to jail. When 11 News at noon returns, we've got beautiful weather outside for now, but all good things must come to an end. We'll let you know when next. And Michigan matchup. The Cougs will play the Wolverines in football for the second time in history. Will they repeat v their victory from 1984? Stay with us. All right, we've got your 11 weather here. Let's take a look outside live on BYU campus. It looks like a beautiful fall day, so not too chilly. With a 56 degree there and the humidity at 43% with pretty calm wind speeds at 8 miles per hour. Uh, so what we can expect for tonight, that temperature will drop a little and we'll have a low at around 44 degrees. And we can see those days are getting shorter with the sunset there at 517 p.m. We'll have mostly clear skies for the rest of the day. And taking a look at those highs, those Utah highs, 
highs. Looks like we're all pretty much in the 60s, so not too high, not too hot today. Um, with St. George, the only 70 degrees, 76 there in St. George. Taking a look at that five-day forecast for for southern Utah, looks like the sun will be with us for at least two more days, and unfortunately, we'll have some rain Friday through Saturday, but the sun will peak out there um, late afternoon on Sunday. So the highs there in the 70s and then getting lower towards the end of the week. Northern Utah, we have that same kind of pattern going on. Sun throughout Thursday, but look at that snow Friday through Sunday. So it's going to be pretty chilly. I was planning on going on to the last home game uh, for BYU, but I don't know if I can stand that weather outside. Jen. Yeah, Ben, I don't know. It looks like it will be a little bit cold outside. I might just have to watch it on my TV. Yeah, record it or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, snow's, snow's what makes the game the most fun. We're going to get there and have a nice, you know, blizzard bowl and a t tough run of the teams. It's really great. Coming in next on sports is Jet and Jet's its second season in the conference. BYU soccer has shown it can be West Coast winners. The Cougars have the conference crown and now they are being recognized for individual play. I'll see what awards were handed out. And Big House Bound, BYU will face off against the Maize and Blue of Michigan in 2015. What that means for the Cougars. Sports is next. Stay tuned. The BYU women's soccer team is now ranked second in the nation, and the awards keep rolling in. The West Coast Conference named forward Michelle Murphy, Conference uh, Freshman of the Year, who, ju who jumped on the scene with eight goals this season. Erica Owens is Goalkeeper of the Year after posting four shutouts. Coach of the Year goes to, to coach, head coach Jennifer Rockwood. Uh, she, uh, she has now received the honor from three different conferences. And defender, defender Lindsay Elizabeth Cudshaw is WCC Player of the Year. The anchor of BOU's stellar defense, she is also a finalist for both the Herman Trophy and Senior Class Awards. BOU had three players both on both the all WC first and second teams. Athletic Director Tom Homo is staying busy putting together BOU's future football schedules. A home and home series with Virginia for 2013 and 2014 has just been announced, with the Cougars traveling to Scott Stadium to open next season and the Cavaliers coming to Provo the following year. Yesterday, it was also announced that BYU will play Michigan in the 2015 season. 11 sports reporter Christine Walk met with BYU football coaches about facing the Michigan Wolverines three years from now. BYU football will face off against the University of Michigan in the largest college football stadium in the country. The Big House holds almost 110,000 screaming fans. Well, they're one of the greatest football programs in the country and their tradition is strong and their fans are great, their stadium's great. It'll be a great experience. Tradition and uh, football history and the atmosphere, it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. BYU and Michigan have faced off only once before in the 1984 Holiday Bowl. BYU defeated them and went on to win the national championship that year. Coach Weber says if they can beat Michigan again, it will give BYU credibility, help with recruiting, and their strength of schedule. BYU is going to battle more tough teams like Michigan in future seasons. The Cougars don't have a good track record against ranked teams this year. But the coaches say to become a better program, they have to play better teams. The, the vision for this program is to make it one of the best programs in America. And uh, the way to do that is by playing the best teams. If BYU can defeat Michigan again, who knows? Maybe another national title is on the horizon for the Cougs. On BYU campus, Christine Wallach, 11 News. Michigan has the most wins in the history of college football, but the Cougars are ready to challenge this football powerhouse. BYU's 2015 schedule is really shaping up with the addition of Michigan, and there isn't room for Bo Diddley Tech. Seven of 12 potential opponents are locked in. The Cougars will face two Big Ten teams early in the year with Nebraska and Michigan, and also have matchups with the two Big East squads in Boise State and Cincinnati, visits to Southern Mississippi and Hawaii, and a game, home game with Utah State round out the 2015 schedule as it now stands. Well, we can't really predict, predict, predict the future, but you know, three years from now, Jamal Williams and Taysom Hill will be seniors, and it should be a really great year for the team. Yeah, and a great season. I mean, they're traveling all over the country. Yeah, we have a lot to look forward to in the future. Thanks, Ben. Still to come on 11 News at Noon. Music development, Cedar Hills Elementary students are getting some early lessons for their musical future. We'll show you why when we come back.
some elementary school students in Cedar Hills are getting the chance to toot their horns. Directors are launching their first band program for 5th and 6th graders at Deerfield Elementary. They want to introduce good playing habits before these kids enter junior high. Teachers expected about 20 students to come to their first practice. Instead, 49 showed up ready to learn. They plan to have their first concert in January. Wow, that sounded like some good music. <laughs> yep, you got you to start somewhere. There you go. Yeah, sure. All right, that's 11 News at Noon, November 7th. You can join us anytime on our website at 11news.byu.edu. Thanks for watching and have a great afternoon.